This set of notes is going to focus on how we deal with other countries that are not our own um, and how we're supposed to do that. And it's one of the shorter sets of notes that we're going to have all year. So we're going to address a couple of the kind of fancy names, the terms for um, dealing with other countries. And one of them uh, right up top here is foreign policy. Um, and foreign policy is simply dealing with other countries. So doing anything you need to, whether it happens to be, you know, the policy of going to war or um, just talking to them and trying to make peace with other countries, trying to decide um, how you are going to trade with each other, any way that our government deals with the government of another country uh, to try and work something out is known as foreign policy or diplomacy. Now, at the very beginning of our country, George Washington was that first president. Everybody loved him. Everybody thought he was great. Um, and he said that the best policy for foreign policy is isolationism. And isolationism means you can kind of hear it in the word isolate. Okay. Isolationism is you are going to stay out of any other country's business. Okay. So you stay out of their business and then they're probably going to stay out of your business and it'll just be so much easier to have to deal with anybody else. However, as the world has changed, because back in George Washington's day, George Washington's day, it might take a month to get from England to the U.S. It was a lot easier to ignore other countries. Now it takes hours to get from England to the U.S. It and you can literally get your ideas and thoughts from one place to another in seconds. And really, you could get um, missiles and bombs and stuff like that there in a matter of minutes to hours. So uh, it's a lot trickier to be isolationist in today's world. And so we've moved, we've tra transitioned from isolationism to how do we deal with these other countries and what is our official policy. The people in charge of dealing with other countries is known as the State Department. And so we've talked before about the President's Cabinet having the Secretary of State uh, that would be kind of one of the leaders of the State Department. Obviously, the president is the main leader of that uh, department. But if you go on the State Department's website and you look at what are the goals of foreign policy, it's going to say these exact words that you see on this slide. Um, and I'll try and go through and explain them real quick um, and kind of some of the hidden ideas that are be behind the words that are shown here. Okay, so the first goal of foreign policy is to preserve national security. So preserving national security, pretty simple. That means we want to keep the United States of America safe, safe from any threats from any other country. We just want people to feel safe as they are living here. The second is to promote world peace. So we want the world to be peaceful, and whatever we can do to make that happen, we are supposed to do um, as a country. That's one of our goals. Our third goal is to maintain the balance of power among nations. Now, this one is where it gets kind of tricky and kind of sly, because that sounds good, right? Let's maintain the balance of power. It's, you know, everybody's happy. We stay the same. However, the reason that we want to maintain the power of our balance of power among nations is because we are one of the most powerful nations. So really, what are you saying here? Are you saying we want to make sure that we stay the most powerful? Are you saying we want to make sure that the weak nations stay weak? Uh, it's kind of a, a, a tricky one. It's not quite as nice as the other two that we've gone over so far. The fourth one is to work with your allies to solve international problems. And that means we're going to work with our friends our the other countries that are our friends to try and solve any problems that we see out there in a way that serves us or our friends best interests so even though it says you know we're going to work with our friends to solve problems for all countries well you're not really solving problems for all countries you're solving problems that you think or things that you think are problems because there's always two sides to every argument but um, that one's just working with your friends to solve the problems that you see in a way that makes you the happiest. The 
fifth one there is to promote democracy and human rights. Pretty much can't argue with human rights. That's things like not having slavery out there and not having, um, you know, people just killing each other and not having governments using biological weapons on their people, things like that. You can't argue much with that. But um, the democracy part, you know, we, we know that we have a democracy, but you've also seen probably some other types of governments and you've heard of some other types of governments. And I don't know who really is to say that democracy is the best one. Now, I think it probably is the best one that we have on the world today, but democracy for sure is not perfect. And so we want to promote our type of government and try and make the other countries kind of like us. And so that's that's part of that promoting democracy. Now, is that what's best for the world? We think so. That's why it's one of our goals. I, even I think so, but um, that's not necessarily a for sure thing. The last goal of foreign policy is to increase trade in any way possible. And so one of the goals that the State Department should always keep in mind is that we want to trade more with other countries because more trade is better for everybody because if it was worse for you, would you trade anything? No, that doesn't make any sense. So you're never forced to trade anything. Um, so these are the goals of the foreign policy as stated by the State Department website. Uh, we're, now we're going to look at the people that are kind of in that State Department and who are beholden to that State Department, so they kind of have to listen to the State Department whenever um, they say something. They're kind of, the State Department's kind of their boss. Um, and the first one who's in the State Department and the head of the State Department is the President. The head of state, he makes all final decisions when it comes to um, dealing with other countries. The only decision, remember, that he cannot make when it comes to that is declaring war. That is Congress's right, not his. Uh, the second one is the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is his second in command, um, and he is, he or she is the person who's the top advisor when it comes to dealing with other countries. Um, the Foreign Service is, uh, it's a group of people that are chose by the president. Uh, to be ambassadors to other countries. And if you're an ambassador to the other country, what you do is you go to that country and you generally stay there and live there in an embassy and you represent your country whenever uh, it needs to happen. So you may meet with the leaders of the other country or um, you may go to the, the special fancy dinners and things like that that the leader of that other country puts on and you are the u.s representatives also if there's a problem with a u.s citizen in one of those countries you step in and try and make it work out best for um, the americans involved so your job is to be in that country and represent the united states in any of the dealings that you can possibly represent them in as an ambassador and so that is the whole group of ambassadors is known as the foreign service the last group within foreign policy is the cia and most of what the cia does is not spying because you know about the cia because you know about the spying and the torturing and uh, guantanamo bay and all that kind of stuff where they sneak into one of the black sites and all this stuff that you see on tv well Almost everybody that works at the CIA does not do that stuff. Yes, there is some spying. There are some clandestine operations that does happen. However, most of the people are in the CIA are people that just sit at a desk and they gather as much information about other countries as they possibly can. So the information might be like the population, the percentage of Christians, the percentage of Muslims, the percentage of Hindus in that country, all that kind of stuff, um, the type of crops that are grown in the country, the amount of crops that are grown, um, pollution numbers, any numbers that you can really think of about a country that describe a country, those are collected by the CIA. And they're all placed together in one, you know, to, they're all placed together, but a lot of that information that isn't secret or anything like that, that's just published right online. So if you go to Google and you type in CIA World Factbook, it will show you 
all the information that the CIA has gathered in one way or another from almost every country in the world. Okay, and it's going to have a whole lot of information in there. So if you're interested in a country, the CIA World Factbook is a great place to start. Um, even you know better than Wikipedia, it's going to have so much information that you need. Any little tiny piece of information is probably out there. So like I say, the CIA is part of the foreign policy, and they're really less about spying and more about gathering information. But yeah, spying is a is a part of our information gathering, and so there are some people who are doing that um, that are Americans right now. We're going to talk about other nations within the borders of our own country, and um, this is kind of a, a strange topic, but it's about Native Americans, okay, and tribal government. So each Native American tribe has its own government, and they are all considered sovereign nations. Okay, and so a sovereign nation means an independent nation that gets to uh, control themselves. Okay, and so they're <clears throat> part of America and they're citizens, the people of the tribe are American citizens, but they're also citizens of that tribe. And so they have a special set of laws that they're required to follow. Okay, and so the first one, or the first uh, characteristic of a sovereign nation is they get to make their own laws so they get to decide what the laws are <clears throat> so an example is that um, you guys know about casinos you know about places where people go in and they gamble uh, their money and try and make more money and do that kind of stuff well <clears throat> the casinos in Minnesota are illegal that that type of gambling is illegal and so um, how are we possibly having casinos well, um, it's not illegal for the Native Americans, for these tribes. Some of them have made it so it's not illegal. And so they will take and put the casino on their land in that area, and they'll let people come in and gamble there. And so because it's a separate little country, because down in Shakopee where Mystic Lake Casino is, that area uh, is part of the uh, Indian Reservation. It is in actually a separate country and you are allowed to go and gamble there because it's legal in that area. Um, the other thing they're able to do is control their own citizens and who they are. So they can add people into the tribe at their own discretion and let them come in. They can also kick people out at their own discretion, however their government works. And so sometimes, if it's a real shady tribal government, if you make the wrong person mad, they can literally deport you. Like, you are no longer a part of this uh tribe and you can't get any of the benefits that um, are involved in being part of that tribe. <clears throat> the third thing is they control absolutely everything on their own lands. And so, like I said before, their own land, the reservations, the places that we, you know, set aside as a government and over time have gotten smaller and smaller, that's theirs. They can do whatever they want with it. They can do whatever they want with the natural resources, the lakes, uh, they have to, you know, create their own streets and roads. They um, they can put up casinos. They can follow whatever their own laws is, but they control absolutely everything on their own land, <clears throat> on those reservations. The last thing is that they have their own police. Their own police are there to enforce their laws. And so an interesting thing about it is if a, a down at Mystic Lake, let's say, the Shakopee Medawakanton Sioux is the tribe there, they have their own police and so if you get in trouble in that region in that reservation then you would get arrested by the tribal police and not by the shakopee police okay and however if you got or if you were right outside of that border in shakopee at like home depot or something shopping and you got in trouble then you would get arrested by the shakopee police however if the Shakopee police were chasing you and they were going and you drove into the reservation, their jurisdiction would end. They would not, without cooperation or, or um, <clears throat> approval from the tribal police, be able to arrest and detain you in that area. It would be like going into another country and arresting someone or like going into Mexico or, or Canada or something like that, which is completely illegal and is actually would be kidnapping and might even be seen as uh, an act of war. So it's kind of a, a different deal, but just keep in mind that the there are other countries inside of our country and they're the Native American 
tribal lands.